Welcome to the Vatikuti Scholar Webinar. I'm Foundation video producer Dave Meinhard, and I am pleased to welcome Dr. Mario Lateo, Jr. as our presenter for today. Dr. Lateo hails from New York City, where he is the Fellowship Director for the Gynecology Services and the Director of Minimal Access and Robotic Surgery Program for the Department of Surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, a respected treatment and research hospital. Dr. Lateo specializes in treating gynecological cancers. He was one of the first gynecologic oncologists to begin using the da Vinci robot to perform procedures for both benign and malignant gynecologic conditions in 2006. In addition to his surgical duties, he is involved in leading several clinical cancer studies involving different medicines, radiation, chemo radiation, and patient quality of life. This is the first in a series of webinars in which the Schuyler program is focusing on gynecology. We really appreciate him taking time from his busy Saturday morning to share this presentation with you, our Vatikuti Scholar audience. Also joining us is Dr. Mahendra Bandari, the CEO of the Vatikuti Foundation and Director of Robotic Surgery Education and Research of the Vatikuti Urology Institute here in Detroit at the Henry Ford Health System. Today he is joining us from Miami, Florida, where he is visiting his family. Good morning, Dr. Bondari. Good morning. I welcome you, Dr. Mario Laito, for accepting to do this webinar for our viewers. To give you a little background, uh, you would be going to India, and you had been to India. Uh, Vatikuti Foundation has identified gynecological cancers as one of the thrust areas, surely because of the volume of these cancers and the, the presentation which is at a very, very advanced stage and surgical treatment matters a lot and minimally invasive surgery in our little experience has done a, a remarkable change in the outlook of, or outcome of these patients. And, uh, Dr. Laito is going with us again uh, in India uh, this time in September to attend Robotic Surgeons Council. And when I announced that most of the people had known him so well, except for me. I haven't met him before, but I heard so much about him from his colleagues, and we are very, very happy that he's joining us this uh, in this series of webinar, which is prelude to our. Uh, his visit to India. I welcome Dr. Laito and hand over mic and the screen to him. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. A great pleasure to be here with you this morning. I'm going to try to provide an update on the management of cervical cancer uh, in 30 minutes, which will be somewhat difficult to cover all of the recent changes in the management of this disease. Uh, I will focus mostly on surgical aspects, but I'll touch on some non-surgical aspects very briefly towards the end. So just in disclosure here, um, I do not have any official agreements with any companies, but I do occasionally ad hoc uh, surgical proctoring in cadaver labs and talks for intuitive surgical, as well as for Novadac, which uh, produces the uh, near-infrared imaging systems for sentinel node mapping. So as a quick brief background, as many of you are already aware of, cervical cancer uh, is a disease that affects many women. Worldwide, it is the number three uh, in terms of cases uh, in women, and it, it accounts for, as the fourth most common cause of deaths from cancer in women worldwide. However, there's a huge difference between what is defined as developed or developing countries in that uh, in developed countries, whatever that may be defined as, uh, cervical cancer is uh, in the top ten, but it's the, the tenth most common cancer in women. And it's not one of the, ho the top 10 causes of death from cancer. In developing countries, cervical cancer is still a huge burden on women. It's the second most common following breast cancer. And it's uh, not only in incidence, but also in death uh, from cancer in women. So it is a, a worldwide problem. Uh, as many of you know already, this is most likely related to the uh, screening um, of cervical cancer uh, and the implementation in certain countries uh, as compared to others. And of course, we recognize in the U.S. here that there are many challenges that are unique to many parts of the world and different from our own country. And even within the U.S., we have patterns where cervical cancer is much more, more common uh, in certain 
groups and in certain parts of the United States because of the same uh, limited access to screening or just uh, patient knowledge of, of the ability to be screened for cervical cancer. Again, a brief background, uh, 2009, FIGO changed the staging for all of our gynecologic cancers. Uh, for cervical cancer, it was minimal change. Stage one, as you can see there, is defined as it always has been. And then stage two, the changes here were very, also, again, minimal. They subdivided 2A into 2A1 and 2A2 based on the size of the gross lesion. The other stages have essentially stayed the same. So the standard treatment for cervical cancer for many years now, as many of you may be aware, it, it involves some form of hysterectomy, chemoradiation, or a combination. Uh, and you can see it broken down by FIGO stage, and obviously there are always caveats to every case. Not every case fits nicely into a, a, a box. But as, as background information, you can see that all of these treatments for cervical cancer often will render the patients unable to have for any children, which in many, in many instances is a, is, a, is a big consideration. In the United States especially, women are delaying their childbearing until their 40s sometimes, and, and that is when there's a, a peak incidence for cervical cancer. So we do unfortunately see many women who have not yet had children or are seeking to have more children who um, are diagnosed with certain invasive cervical cancer. So some of the more recent updates in surgery for uh, cervical cancer is uh, the concept of a nerve-sparing radical hysterectomy as compared to a standard type 3 known as either the Wertheim hysterectomy, Okobayashi hysterectomy, where the extensive parametrial tissue is resected uh, at least two centimeters up the vagina. And when one does that, you can see that the nerves, the hypogastric nerves here, are often injured during this procedure as we mobilize the ureter laterally, free the bladder. Many of the hypogastric plexus, the inferior hypogastric plexus, is often damaged or taken during a standard radical hysterectomy that we've done for many, many years. So many authors have uh, proposed a nerve-sparing approach. But again, as I'll show later, we really have to actually just question the radicality of our surgeries. As we have seen in breast cancer, less radical surgery has been associated with better, out with better patient outcomes as well as maintaining oncologic outcomes. And so we really have to question the radicality of, of the procedures that we are doing for the, some of these cervical cancers, especially very early small lesions. And of course, if you spare the nerves, one would assume that you have better preservation or less risk of injury to bladder and rectal function. So what is the data on this? Unfortunately, there's very little randomized data uh, available in the world's literature regarding nerve sparing radical hysterectomy. This is a recent publication, which is, sta as, is stated as a randomized controlled trial, but the when reading the methodology, it's not quite clear as how well it was done. But be it as it may, this is probably the only one I could find, a, a randomization to standard radical hysterectomy, type 3, versus a nerve sparing uh, radical hysterectomy. You can see here these are very small numbers, actually. Uh, and this was, it's unclear if this was supposed to be a superiority trial or a non-inferiority trial, uh, which has huge implications as to how you interpret the results. But what these authors do show is consistent with uh, the majority of the other retrospective trials that have been there, have been published, and prospective single-arm trials. Essentially, you can see here that compared to conventional radical hysterectomy, as uh, a nerve sparing radical hysterectomy, bladder compliance is much less effective. This is the baseline bladder compliance as measured by these authors using the urodynamic assessments. There's a, at one month is the pink bars, the tan bars are at three months after surgery, and at, at one year later is the, is the other bar here. And for a conventional radical hysterectomy, there's a significant decrease in bladder compliance within a month. There's some regain of compliance, but it's still significantly less than at baseline. Whereas for the nurse bearing, at one year, there's re, uh, at least at three months, and, and also definitely at one year, the difference in bladder compliance seems to have um, resolved and is no longer statistically different from baseline. However, what one can see here, and one must take these data with caution, is that there's a huge uh, confidence interval here, which, which reflects the small numbers. And while intriguing, this still needs to be uh, uh, taken with uh, what we say a grain of salt. For residual urine, one again sees the same findings that after a conventional radical hysterectomy, there seems to be 
much higher residual urine after the patient's urinates one month, three months, and a year later after conventional radical hysterectomy. And whereas with the nerve sparing, there is a worsening of uh, residual urine amounts uh, a month after surgery, but these seem to go back to baseline. Again, these bars are all very close and with huge confidence intervals, so one must be cautious to overly interpret this, these data. And the authors also uh, propose that there is no adverse impact on oncologic outcome when doing a less radical nerve sparing radical hysterectomy, uh, and that the disease free survival as well as overall survival are very similar. Again, keep in mind this is a very small number of cases. This was, does not seem to have been designed as a non inferiority trial, which would be the proper trial design to assess oncologic outcome. So nerve sparing radical hysterectomy, and I apologize if I'm going somewhat quickly as I want to like, cover many different things in a relatively short period of time. Um, and there's much greater detail I can provide on many individual topics at, at a later date if possible. So is the nerve sparing radical hysterectomy the new standard for patients with cervical cancer requiring a radical hysterectomy? Well, that, honestly, that remains to be determined. I think many of us are reducing the radicality of our hysterectomy without performing a uh, a prescribed nerve sparing procedure, and many of us tend not to go uh, as uh, out to the sidewall as, as we have in the past, and many of us tend to uh, avoid going deep past the uterosacral ligaments where the hypogastric nerves are encountered. Uh, specifically to a nerve sparing radical hysterectomy, the reports are all still quite small. Uh, a properly designed randomized trial has not yet been done. As I've mentioned, you would need a non-inferiority design to truly answer the question if it, that is equally uh, efficacious for survival. And again, as I've said, do we always need to be so radical anyway? And the data that are emerging to suggest that the radicality needs to be questioned is that there have been five retrospective studies here, but encompassing over 1,000 patients combined. And then if you have small tumors, you can see the stages there measuring mostly less than two, two centimeters or less with no lymph vascular space invasion. And if the lymph nodes, the pelvic lymph nodes are not involved, the risk of having parametrial involvement is exceedingly low, with the combined number being 0.3%. So one really must question the need for extensive parametrial resection in these especially smaller tumors with low risk for parametrial extension. Unfortunately, we often do not know if the pelvic lymph nodes are involved, and so I will show how we have been approaching some of these cases, mostly in the setting of fertility preservation. Now, in terms of lymph nodes and whether to assess lymph nodes, one needs to know what is the risk of lymph node metastasis, one, and two, would it affect treatment? And of course, we all know that lymph node involvement is a very adverse prognostic factor, but it is also predictive of treatment in that Patients with positive lymph nodes or lymph node metastasis will require adjuvant therapy. It's one of the criteria for deciding to administer adjuvant therapies. Uh, and so what is the risk of lymph node metastasis cervical cancer? Essentially, there is a, a, a real risk of lymph node metastasis in most cervical cancers, except for those that are very small, 1A1, with no lymph vascular space invasion in the tumor itself. The risk of a lymph node spread is not zero, but is less than 1%. Whereas for all other categories in this, uh, in, in these very early cancers, 1A1 with LVSI, 1A2, regardless of LVSI, the risk is 8%, 8 to 10%, depending on the studies that, are, that you read. So therefore, we feel that some form of lymph node assessment, which is typically done with a pelvic lymph adenectomy, uh, be considered in all cases. So let's question lymph adenectomy in recent uh, evidence uh, now. Uh, adding more controversy to another aspect of the surgical treatment for patients with cervical cancers. And again, when I speak of cervical cancer, this is mostly for squamous cell and adenocarcinomas. I did not mention that earlier. There are very rare cervical cancers, such as small cell neuroendocrine carcinomas and, and sarcomas, which this, these data and this talk is not uh, applied to. So lymphadenectomy, many of us now are much more aware of the risk of lymphedema in patients undergoing lymphadenectomy for gynecologic cancers. It was something that was ignored for many time, for a long time, uh, but now we are becoming much more aware of this. And this was a randomized study. This is actually assessing the role of laparoscopic surgical staging in patients with uh, locally advanced cervical cancers. The results have not yet been published here in terms of outcome, but what they did report in this study, which is online, recently published, 
was that patients uh, were randomized either to surgical staging with pelvic and aortic lymphadenectomy versus just primary radiotherapy for those who uh, had preoperative criteria uh, sufficient to just uh, suggest chemo radiation would be appropriate. So what I really, really want to there's two things that can be highlighted from this study. One is that this isn't coming up. 33% of patients who were staged surgically with normal imaging actually were found to have microscopic neural disease. So yes, imaging will not detect all spread to lymph nodes, and therefore uh, many are proposing a surgical staging procedure, even in cases where we would not do a radical pelvic procedure, but would just administer chemo radiation. This, yet, this also is another area I'll discuss a little later, and also is controversial still. But what also must be noted is that in patients who had surgical staging and receive radiation, the risk of lymphedema of the lower extremity was 70%. This can be quite debilitating, especially in younger women, as often they cannot wear the same shoes if, if it's an asymmetric lymphedema. They, they often feel uncomfortable wearing their normal clothing that they would like to wear also. So we must consider this when we're making decisions about how to approach these patients surgically. And this is the plot of the patients who had lymph node dissection before chemo radiation versus those who just received radiation and chemotherapy. These are the patients who develop lymphedema. You can see this lymphedema. Uh, the onset is, is within 12 months for the majority of these patients, and it is persistent in the majority also. Whereas those few who, who develop lymphedema, it was nearly five years later, is, which is consistent with uh, known radiation effects that are secondary, which happen many years after the radiation is completed. Um, and in those, it, obviously, when the onsets, they were still ongoing. These blue bars mean they're, it's ongoing lymphedema. Whereas the yellow bars with the stop means that these patients develop lymphedema, and then for some reason, these few handful of patients, luckily, the lymphedema resolve. Now, we here at, at our institution at Memorial Sloan Kettering have been doing sentinel lymph node mapping for our gynecologic tumors, except for ovary cancer, since 2005. We feel that this is really a happy middle ground for endometrial cancer for certain, and we also feel it might it is, it is likely going to be the answer for cervical cancer. Now, much more, many more trials need to be done and more data needs to be published before we can make this statement uh, across the board. Uh, but we are very excited about sentinel lymph node mapping for cervical cancers. It's a nice compromise from an extensive retroperitoneal lymph node dissection up to the renal vein, as you see here in one of our cases, where now, instead of removing all of these lymph nodes, we can just obtain the information we need by removing the one or two lymph nodes that uh, are sentinel. Now, sentinel, a few brief words about sentinel lymph node mapping. It, uh, we have tried many different uh, approaches, including technetium, uh, use of technetium, preoperative lymphocytograms, uterine injections, fundal injections. We've tried all methods. We have ultimately decided and feel that the simplest is the easiest to reproduce and teach worldwide. Sentinel lymph node mapping can be done now at our institution, and what we have been recommending is either with a blue dye alone, either methylene blue, lymphazorin, and now more recently, in the past four, five, six years possibly, we have been using endocyanin green with the near-infrared imaging. This here, I cannot, I don't have enough time to speak of all the data on this, but the near-infrared imaging with endocyanin green has been remarkably better in terms of uh, mapping patients than the blue dyes alone, at, and also as compared to blue dye and technetium. So we inject there have been a, um, there's, there's a discussion as to where to inject the cervix. We have tried four quadrant injection, as you see here. The problem with this injection is that with especially the blue dyes, the bladder, the vesicle uterine uh, space, and the rectal vaginal space get very discolored and make the dissection somewhat difficult, especially for cervical cancer. Uh, and we do not, and the lymphatics, if uh, you're aware of the anatomy, the lymphatics do not drain from anterior and posterior, but they follow along with the, the uterine artery. And that would be lateral. So now we no longer inject four quadrants, but we have been injecting merely at the 3 and 9 o'clock position. We inject uh, submucosally, and then we advance the needle approximately a centimeter into the cervix, into the stroma, and inject another CC there. And then we repeat that at the other side. So that is our preferred methodology. I do not have time to show all the data as to how we arrived at this methodology, but this is our preferred methodology for central lymph node mapping for cervix and uterine cancer. And sentinel lymph node mapping is not just removing blue or green nodes. One needs to use some judgment. 
when you enter the abdomen, you obviously will look around. Any is suspicious. If washings are for uterine cancer, obviously, but not for cervix. Um, and if there's any concerning findings, you would obviously remove those abnormal lesions in the in the abdomen. That goes without saying, hopefully. Uh, then you would then you would open the retroperitoneal space. If you see any map, any sentinel nodes that are mapped, obviously you remove that with pathologic ultrastaging. But keep in mind that any enlarged lymph nodes cannot be ignored. So any uh, clinically suspicious nodes must also be removed, irrespective of whether they map. And actually. Some of the detection rates can be affected when there's tumor within the lymph node that is, a, that is a blocking the lymphatic flow, and therefore you, the dye cannot reach that lymph node because it is full of tumor, and actually that would be the central node that happens to be involved with tumor. If for some reason you cannot map on, on any pelvis, and there is no enlarged lymph nodes, then we recommend a site-specific lymphadenectomy, and periorectal lymphadenectomy being as controversial as it is, we leave it up to the, the discretion of the surgeon. So this is uh, some examples. The, the, these central lymph node mappings can absolutely be done uh, laparoscopically. This is uh, a laparoscopic central lymph node mapping from one of my, my partners uh, using blue dye. And you can see here the channels which follow the uh, uterine vascular uh, anatomy coming across here, the superior, uh, the bladder umbilical uh, vessel here, into the obturator space. This is the left external iliac vein on the left. And you can see here these nice channels coming across into what is the sentinel lymph node in the obturator nodal basin, which is the most common location for the sentinel nodes. And here's just another picture of the same case where the, it has been further dissected. And you can see a clearly blue node with a lymphatic channel coming from the uterus. One needs to not make, I'm going to go backwards here. One not, needs not to make the mistake that the first blue node they find they call sentinel. Because often if you wait long enough, the secondary lymph nodes will also turn blue as the lymphatics will continue to drain. And so if you find the lymph node in the external iliac region or common, that may not be the sentinel node. You need to follow the channels back towards the uterus to ensure that there are no additional lymph nodes in between the uterus and the lymph node that you additionally identified. And that actually is part of the learning curve and will affect detection rates, but not only detection rates, most importantly, may at a falsely increase your false negative rate because you're not taking the correct central node, you're taking a non-central lymph node. And that is all part of the learning curve for central lymph node mapping for, for our gynecologic malignancies. And again, can't be overemphasized, if you, op if you enter the abdomen, here's a, a, another laparoscopic image, you open the abdomen and you find a lymph node that looks like that, and it's not blue or green, you don't say that it didn't map. You just take that lymph node out. If any suspicious lymph nodes should be removed. These are the, some of the data that are published regarding central node mapping for cervical cancer. We just exclude, uh, we've just uh, taken out uh, reports with more than 50 cases, and I borrowed this from my, my friend and colleague at MD Anderson, Dr. Pronovitz. To summarize, for all cervical cancers in which central lymph node mapping has been recorded, the detection rate overall, whether it's one side of the pelvis or both hemipelvises, is 92%. If you look at uh, side-specific, meaning uh, bilateral detection essentially, it goes down to 80%. Positive lymph node rates of approximately 20%, which is what would be expected for this cohort of patients. The sensitivity is, is good at 93%, and most importantly, the negative predictive value is nearly 99%. So, Central lymph node mapping is not perfect. There will be some false negatives no matter how it's done. But that false negative rate is accepted by many other cancers in which central lymph node mapping is performed. And that is usually less than 3%. And that's what we see here. Now, more specifically, if you look at the size of tumor, that can affect your central lymph node mapping results. So for tumors that are larger than 2 centimeters, on the cervix, the detection rate goes down to 80%, and the bilateral detection rate is only uh, is less than 60%. Now that is possibly related to the, the, the larger tumors will have a higher risk of lymphatic involvement, therefore tumor in lymph nodes that are not allowing the dyes to penetrate. The negative predictive value is 95%, which can be a little concerning is that the false negative rate then would be approximately 5%. Now for small tumors, less than two centimeters, it is nearly perfect. And there is no such thing as perfect in medicine and in surgery and in cancer care especially. But based on uh, combined si over 600 patients, the detection rate is 95%, the size-specific detection rate is 
the negative predictive value is 100%, which would mean there would be a false negative rate of zero. In other words, with sentinel lymph node mapping for a small cervical cancer, you are identifying nodal spread. The question then comes, is a full lymphadenectomy necessary uh, in patients who have positive sentinel lymph nodes? If they have their sentinel lymph nodes are normal, then the risk of uh, additional lymph nodes with a, full, with a negative predictive value of 100%, then that is reliable in stating that there are no lymphatic metastasis and you could spare the unnecessary morbidity in patients who have no lymph node involvement because removing 50 normal lymph nodes is not going to help any single patient. The question still remains, what is the role of completion lymphadenectomy in patients who have a positive central lymph node? It is a controversial topic in many cancers. Now, there is a learning curve. So if uh, you currently do not perform central lymph node mapping, you must realize this. You, it, it would be a suggestion to either do this on a protocol if possible, but if not, um, one should add central lymph node mapping to what you do as your standard until you've overcome the learning curve, which based on a report from our institution is approximately 30 cases. This will obviously vary by surgeon, um, but we do suggest caution in just replacing your standard lymph node assessment with central lymph node mapping. Now, cervical cancers can absolutely be treated with newly invasive approaches, either laparoscopic with or without the, I mean laparoscopic with or without the robot. Our view of the robot is that it is a tool that is tremendously valuable in performing minimally invasive surgeries or laparoscopy. And what is the issue with cervical cancer? The rates of, well the rates of, of MIS for endometrial cancer are very low in most parts of the world including the United States. The robot has overcome many of those limitations and therefore has allowed us to do much more minimally invasive surgery. This is data from our own institution for our radical hysterectomies over those, those years that you see at the bottom. It was presented at our, our recent SGO meeting in Chicago. And you can see here that in blue is the rate of laparotomy for cervical cancer to perform radical hysterectomy. Before we introduced a, we introduced a robotics program at my institution, I had returned from somewhere else where I had done robotic surgery. And at Sloan Kettering, we really instituted a formal program in 2007. You can see when we started the program, the rate of laparotomy was nearly 100%. Because laparoscopic approaches with traditional instruments found to be very challenging. Once the program has matured, you can see here that the rate of laparotomy has decreased to approximately 30%. And honestly, the reason that it's still at this rate is because some of our surgeons have not yet adopted the robot. Uh, surgeons who are doing robotic procedures, the rate of MIS for radical hysterectomy is 100% nearly. So there's a huge value to uh, minimally invasive surgery, as we know, and again, I do not have time to cover all the data out there. But a brief note, for, so for endometrial cancer, there is a randomized data a trial, GOGLAP2, that showed a tremendous benefit to MIS over laparotomy for uterine cancers. For cervical cancer, there's many retrospective studies, single institution studies, multi-institution studies, but there has not yet been a randomized trial specifically to this. There is one ongoing, which is being led by our friends at MD Anderson, uh, Dr. Ramirez, which is World International, that is randomly assigning women with ra for radical hysterectomy to either laparoscopy, either with or with, it can be done with or without the robot, versus laparotomy. I can only assume that the results of the trial will just confirm with the results of many other trials I've shown for minimally invasive surgery as compared to laparotomy, that there will be a patient benefit with no compromise in oncologic outcome. Now our own data here, which we, put, we presented recently, one can see here, we, we, did, we did attempt some lap, straight standard laparoscopic cases, but there were very few. The operative time is much less than a, a standard laparoscopic approach, at least in our institution, and yes, it is long laparotomy by about an hour, but that's acceptable. The blood loss is significantly less, which is not only reflected by estimated blood loss, but also uh, pre and post manicure changes, and the length of stay is one day as compared to three days median for laparotomy. Actually now, we send our patients home and consider sending them home the same day of their procedure. So our patients now have routinely offered uh, same day discharge after a robotic radical hysterectomy with lymph node dissection even. We've had great experience with that. Now in terms of oncologic resection, there's absolutely no compromise as compared to laparotomy. So we are achieving the same oncologic resection using robotic platform with better patient outcomes. Now we do not have survival outcome yet, as uh, this is a relatively 
recent cohort, and we'd like to wait uh, further uh, follow-up to really be able to provide useful uh, uh, survival data. Uh, as these are many early-stage cancers, the, luckily many patients are surviving their cancer. What we also saw with direct cost analysis is that the robotic approach, even if including the capital cost of, at this time we have uh, five robots at the time of this analysis, that even including the purchase cost of those robots, it was significantly less than laparotomy for radical hysterectomy. If you exclude the capital cost, you can see the amount of savings there per case. And this is directly related to, at least in the United States, and I know there are differences in other parts of the world, the, the decrease in length of stay, which is expensive in the United States, but also, most importantly, the decrease in complications and in the management of those complications, which are expensive, especially infections, recatheterizations, sometimes fewer pubic catheters that need to be inserted, so uh, fistulas that develop. So all of this must be factored into costs. And not only, and this does not account, actually, for the cost of the society in terms of uh, uh, fun, um, contribution of the patient to society, meaning returning to work, returning to their normal activities, which is always much improved with MIS approaches as compared to laparotomy. Again, I re we all recognize that there are cultural differences all over the world where this may or may not be as important. Some of the updates in terms of the primary management of uh, earlier staged uh, cervical cancers. Now, all of those approaches, uh, meaning uh, hysterectomy, whether radical, nerve sparing, or, or less than that, all result in a, in a loss of fertility for our young women. There is much data now, and in the NCCN does allow uh, fertility sparing options as, as an acceptable option for young women who are desirous of retaining fertility. This ranges, there are very, many different options that have been published. You can do a simple excisional large cone biopsy with no lymph node dissection. You can do a lymph node dissection for those cases who have, and you, one can just uh, consider plus minus central lymph node here, um, excisional cone biopsy for certain other cases. Radical vaginal trachelectomy has the most experience so far. Uh, this was a uh, procedure that was pioneered by Dr. Darshan from France. Radical abdominal hysterectomy is being done more frequently now to try to expand our indications and, and tumor size. Robotic now offer the benefits of MIS to both these rather complex and there are some reports of using neoadjuvant as well as adjuvant chemotherapy. Really, neoadjuvant chemotherapy to then do a, a, to try to reduce the radicality. Now, this is a very novel approach. Uh, in all honesty, we have not uh, taken this approach here at our institution yet, but it's one that's quite interesting. And the preliminary data su suggests a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, and favorable outcome for for these young women who are trying to preserve fertility. Um, we have yet to wait to see more data published before you can uh, feel comfortable in routinely offering this. Now, in terms of an excisional cone biopsy with no lymph node assessment, this is really reserved for, uh, for patients. This is without lymph node That's very early stage 1A1, no lymphatic space invasion. There's been multiple publications. This is one of the largest ones. 400 women meeting these criteria. Cone biopsies were performed um, in 241 of these women who wanted fertility. They all were at 1A1 with no LVSI, and there was absolutely no recurrences in this group. So for a very small cervical cancer with no lymph vascular space and vision, an excisional cone biopsy is absolutely acceptable if they desire fertility or a simple hysterectomy in those who have completed uh, fertility. One could also argue in those who have completed fertility that it might be a reasonable consideration to limit the morbidity of hysterectomy, especially in areas where surgical uh, complications may be more of a concern. Now, a new approach for larger tumors is a cone, excisional cone biopsy acceptable. That, there is data that are quite interesting, and for this here at our institution, we have been considering in very select patients, and we are very clear about the very early nature of the data, uh, and they, under, they need to understand they may be taking a risk, which we have yet to define, but a publication from Italy with 1B1 tumors, so tumors that are uh, more than 1A, measuring up to uh, um, and visible tumors also, what their approach was by these authors is that the tumor was 2 to 3 centimeters, they received neoadjuvant chemo, but in tumors less than 2 centimeters, and this is, this is the part that we're trying to adopt here at our institution, they perform a colonization only. But it was not just this colonization, they also had an assessment of the lymph nodes, so a laparoscopic pelvic lymph node dissection was done, and a cone biopsy was done. And the only patients who, where this can be considered is if the cone biopsy has negative margins and the lymph nodes are normal. So in this cohort, that 36 of these patients, you can see here the median follow-up is over five years, which is, which is very good. 
They only, they only noted one recurrence in the same person who recurred died. This is very promising uh, and worthy of consideration, but one must take again the, uh, with caution these data as it is still quite early. Uh, and there have been 21 pregnancies in 14 patients, which is a, seems to be better than our radical trachelectomy. One can only make the r r rational assumption that doing a cone biopsy results in less trauma than doing a radical trachelectomy, uh, which I will discuss in a little bit. So is this a new approach? Uh, we have been considering this here, doing a excisional cone biopsy in pelvic lymph node dissection, or actually we now do a laparoscopic or robotic central node mapping instead of a full lymph node dissection with cone biopsy for very select cases. Obviously, they did, must have to desire future fertility. There has to be no metastasis on imaging. We feel that this is really uh, highly uh, attractive for patients with a stage 1A1 lesion with the LVSI. Those who have 1A2 also without LVSI, we feel comfortable discussing this with our patients. When you start to get the larger tumors, one must take great caution. Using the data I showed about parametrial extension, it can be a possible consideration, again with caution, for 1B1 tumors that are small with minimal stromal invasion, um, as well as those, and, and without LVSI, as well as those with LVSI who have even less stromal invasion. They must have negative pelvic lymph nodes and the core margins are negative in order to preserve fertility. If the cone margins are positive, one must consider a radical trachelectomy. If the pelvic nodes are positive, the fertility sparing options are no longer possible as either require a radical surgical procedure or at here, at least in our institution, patients with lymph node positivity will be treated with chemo radiation. This will completely affect the fertility of patients and render them infertile. Now, radical vaginal trachelectomy has, uh, we have much more experience with this and this is now allowed as an acceptable option within the NCCN guidelines. These are our criteria that we've used for many years. This is uh, for squamous cell, adenocarcinoma of squamous. We do not offer this for the small cell carcinomas, the rare sar sarcomas of the cervix, uh, because those are extremely high risk cancers that fertility preservation, unfortunately, is not possible. Uh, these are the criteria you see here, stage 1A with LBSI, 1A2 to 1B1, less than two centimeter tumors that they need to desire fertility. We have all of our patients speak to an infertility specialist as they will most likely need some assistance and also to assess them for their uh, ability to, to have fertility in the future, um, uh, sort of their own underlying baseline infertility assessment. Uh, again, we realize that this may not be possible everywhere around the world, but it's something to consider. Uh, there has to be no imaging, uh, no metastasis on, uh, noted on imaging. We do recommend MRI, and, and again, recognize this may be a limitation uh, of access, uh, but the MRI, you need to have at least um, uh, more than two centimeters of cervix, and there has to be what appears to be uh, uh, enough endocervical margin free of tumor. They need to be a candidate for vaginal surgery. Obviously, if they have a very narrow vagina, then it's not possible and it'll be very difficult. Uh, and we like to wait about four to six weeks after colonization. This is an ideal can one of our patients who is an ideal candidate. She has approximately a 1.2 centimeter tumor. There is approximately 1.7 centimeters of leading normal endocervical margin, as you see here. So this is an ideal candidate for a trachelectomy. So how do we do this? We first perform a laparoscopic abnormal assessment, either lymphadenectomy or central node. Now we send it for frozen section. If it's negative, the lymph nodes have no metastasis at time of frozen, then we'll frozen section, we'll proceed with trachelectomy. Uh, some of my partners like to use bilateral uterostents, and that is an option, although I prefer not to use them. And then when we do the trachelectomy, which I'll show some of the steps, we, we need to have an 8 millimeter free margin on frozen section. If we have an 8 millimeter or greater free margin, then the procedure is uh, successful and we're finished. If there's a less than five millimeter margin, and that we have publications on exactly how pathologists do frozen section on these specimens, as it is somewhat detailed. If there's a less than five millimeter margin, we will attempt to excise if there's additional cervix that we feel present. If the margin is possible, the likelihood of achieving a negative margin is very low. At that point, we decide to abort and perform a radical hysterectomy. We do here place a permanent cerclage to help with uh, uh, preventing premature deliveries in the future. But this is also controversial. We do suture the vaginal margin back to the stroma, the remaining cervix, and then we take a look in again laparoscopically to see how things look. 
This is the resection for a radical hysterectomy. And with a, a trachelectomy, the resection is much less. This is why radical abdominal trachelectomy is caught on uh, more frequently because the resection specimen is much larger. And so for radical abdominal trachelectomies, we've been uh, offering this more recently also. And this allows us to go to a much larger tumor. Uh, but the other criteria are essentially the same. The only thing that there's some concern of, and this yet remains yet to be determined, is, the, is that does the, do these uh, procedures done abdominally, since many of us sacrifice the uterine arteries, although some reports preserving them, and it's controversial what the benefit may be of that, uh, there is some concern of greater risk of uh, isnic stenosis and amenorrhea possibly. Is there, is there more stenosis of the new cervical os? Is there more pelvic adhesions? Is there lower fertility rates? We, we're not certain just yet. Uh, in terms of the pelvic adhesions, doing these in a minimally invasive fashion will have much less lower rate of, uh, of adhesions forming. It can be done robotically because of time I cannot show the video, but it can absolutely be done robotically. Uh, about uh, patients who, and the publications there, including our own from Dr. Sonoda, about 90% uh, of the time, we can complete the planned surgery. 10% of the time, we either find positive lymph nodes or a positive cervical margin and therefore we have to abort the procedure. So this is a number to know when you're counseling your patients that there is a 10% chance that they will wake up with the radical hysterectomy having to have been uh, done anyway. Now the data for radical abdominal trachelectomies is, is emerging. This is our own data which was published two years ago. And really for these larger tumors, as you'd assume, they have a higher risk of positive margins as well as a higher risk of lymph node involvement that actually instead of 90% uh, uh, successful trachelectomy, it's only 30%. So many can view this, and two, we can view this in two ways. One, what's the point, since 70% of the, the time you can't do that. Or you can also view this as saying at least 30% of women who would have had a radical hysterectomy, you could have potentially preserved her fertility. This needs to be interpreted individually. Oncologic outcomes, as uh, combining multiple data, have shown a benefit. There will never be a randomized trial in this field because you're talking about fertility preservation. These women will not be willing to undergo a randomization to radical hysterectomy or trachelectomy. It's just going to be impossible. But of the publications out there, it seems that these oncologic outcomes similar. Our own data published uh, a few years ago shows that in 1v1 cases, comparing radical trachelectomy, the vaginal abdominal, to radical hysterectomy, the, the, the trachelectomies are in green, the disease-free survival and the overall survival, spe disease-specific survival, seem not to be compromised. These are preliminary with low follow-up, and we will continue to follow these patients up to ensure that this is the finding that, that persists. Pregnancies are possible. As compared to 0% rate with uh, the traditional hysterectomies, this is promising. Trachelectomies, also pregnancy rates of about 16%, which seems to be somewhat similar to vaginal, but slightly less. So this uh, requires further uh, data to be published. Now, that's for the early stage lesions. For locally advanced cervical cancer, radical surgery is often not considered. So there's, uh, there's still some controversy as to what the best approach is. There are, uh, there are uh, some who uh, propose surgical staging, including pelvic and aortic lymphadenectomy. Uh, others just use clinical staging. Uh, and then if uh, there's no, cons no, uh, no, sus no suspicion for, for periodic lymph node involvement, they just give primary pelvic chemo radiation. If there's any suggestion of uh, lymph nodes in the periodic region being involved, an extended field radiation is given. Uh, this is a randomized trial that these authors are, are, are proposing and are uh, performing. And it reflects that we still do not have the best one option for these patients. And in this group, what they published in this publication, although the survival is not published yet, is that 33% of these cases will be upstaged if the surgical stage is performed. The question then comes, what is the value of that? And the only randomized trial looking at surgical staging for locally advanced cervical cancers, there's only one, published many, uh, over 10 years ago now. This actually was terminated early because in patients who underwent surgical staging, the survival was much worse. It is unclear why this is because other retrospective series and some single-arm prospective series have suggested this may not be the case, but this trial was ended. This actually affected surgical staging for many of us. Uh, however, it is, uh, it is uh, experiencing a re resurgence of, of this approach. Now, one must keep in mind a few things um, uh, when, when trying to decide whether surgical staging and local advanced cervical cancer is necessary. One is that 
Yes, surgical staging will detect nodal metastases that are not seen on imaging currently, even PET CTs, whatever you want to do. There is a morbidity, though, that one must consider. Does it really matter, though? Because if the lymph nodes in the periodic region are normal, yes, now you know about it, but that doesn't make that patient live any longer. It just changes their risk factors. And if the lymph nodes in the periodic region are positive, can we really alter their outcome? Because periodic lymph node metastasis is associated with a very poor outcome generally. So the role remains unclear for surgical staging. Here we see even just prophylactic extended field irradiation in patients with normal imaging without surgical staging. Um, did not make did not make a difference in the current era of, of chemo radiation. So here you can see here radiation of the pelvis only with concurrent chemo radiation, concurrent chemotherapy, as compared to extended field radiation when chemo, chemotherapy is given concurrently, there was no difference in overall survival for these patients. There was a, a benefit for extended field in those who did not receive chemotherapy with the radiation. So in the current era of chemo radiation, this is another reason to strongly consider chemo radiation that the extended field of radiation probably does not make a difference. This further lends debate and question of, of the need for surgical staging before uh, radiation for these patients. And these are the data that have been published, well known, 1999, where chemotherapy added to radiation became the standard approach, at least in the United States, and I do believe worldwide. Now, a problem with this is that radiation access is, is limited. And this is uh, from a publication um, where you can see here the different colors show how many, how, each, how many people uh, are uh, served by a radiation unit in various countries. Here in the United States, you can see less than 500,000 people are serviced by a radiation unit. This is likely the population divided by the number of radiation centers available. And you can see in some countries, more than 20 million are, 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 are served by one radiation unit. Uh, this is uh, India here. Uh, this may be uh, different uh, in more recent times, but this publication was from four years ago. So obviously radiation therapy, as much as we talk about it being a standard, um, it, you know, one must uh, remember that uh, this may not be possible uh, in terms of access to radiation therapy. So what do you do? And there are authors who have suggested a more radical primary surgery, either primary generation or as Dr. Hockel from Germany has published, what is called a laterally extended endopelvic resection, where you really take all the lymphatic basin along with the primary tumor uterus cervix but as well as the hypogastric nerves, the internal iliac vasculature, and some of the muscles uh, of the piriformis here. And there are different types. You can do an anterior in the pelvic layer. You can do a, a total, which is the entire pelvic viscera. Uh, this obviously is going to be a morbid procedure. But in this uh, series, these patients had these extensive surgeries and did not receive chemo radiation afterwards. And what they suggest here is that the overall survival for primary tumors, which they did have 30 primary tumors and recurrences, seem to be somewhat favorable with five-year survivals of 60% and higher, 70%, which for a locally advanced tumor is quite um, encouraging. Um, and so this might be a consideration for patients where radiation uh, access is quite limited to do these more extensive procedures, but this comes at a cost. 50% of patients will have severe complications, of which many can be quite severe. There's extensive blood loss, and these surgeries on average take 12 hours to perform. So that is the cost of, of these uh, very extensive procedures in the primary setting. One again must individualize your patient's care and decide what might offer the best chances of survival and weigh these risks and benefits. For recurrent cervical cancer, just a few words. Uh, really uh, briefly, uh, we really do favor radiation therapy if, it's not, if the area has not been radiated previously. Again, this might not be possible everywhere, but where radiation therapy access is available, this would be a primary consideration. We do consider resection of isolated non-public recurrences alone or prior to giving radiation. And this is usually nodal recurrences around the periodic region. We, we often consider resection followed by post-operative radiation to the field. Exenerative procedures for public recurrences in a radiated field is, is essentially our standard recommendation in patients who have been pre previously radiated to the pelvis. And in some, in some instances, a, a, an exenter procedure without prior radiation may be a consideration, especially in, in areas with limited radiation access. Chemotherapy can be used in patients who are no longer surgical candidates, but the responses are somewhat limited. We strongly encourage trial participation, if possible, for these patients. This, uh, the pelvic exoneration was uh, instituted and developed at our institution in, 19, in the 1940s by Dr. Brunswick here. He was the chief of our service. That's Memorial Sloan Kettering. The first public he published is uh, first experience 
in the, in the first edition of Cancer, the journal, in 1948. This is the lines of resection. Basically, all the pelvic organs were resected, and then he closed up the defect and created a wet colostomy with the ureters being implanted proximal to the stoma. This is one of his patients that was actually in the publication. Uh, she was uh, his sixth case. And then in this first report by Dr. Brunswick in 1948, nearly 70 years ago, there were 22 cases. The problem here is that five patients died after surgery, 23%. So very high mortality rate. Uh, the, the wet colostomy had many problems because the ureters were proximal to the stomach, so there were many ascending infections. As you can see here, the cause of death were actually mostly infectious. So the classic indication for pelvic degeneration for many years is a small central recurrence, two centimeters or less within the radiation field. Uh, we do an extensive assessment of these patients, which I, uh, for lack of time, will we'll move forward. And this is the ideal candidate, small central recurrence in a previously radiated field. We do consider laparoscopic assessment before proceeding with the exoneration at the same time because you can abort the procedure because of a metastatic disease that's identified that was not appreciated preoperatively in 55% of patients, and this would avoid the morbidity of a laparotomy. So we do perform laparoscopic assessment prior to moving ahead with the exoneration. These are the exoneration categories. Essentially, you can do an anterior exoneration where the uterus is still present, vagina and bladder are resected. You can do a posterior where it's the uterus, vagina, and rectum. You can do a total where everything's resected. And then you can do a supralevator resection above the levator muscles. You can do a translevator resection, and, which is called an infralevator. Uh, and you can either take the vulva or not. This, these, uh, the type of recession will be uh, man dictated by the, the extent of the tumor, with the goal being to always achieve negative margins. And there's been multiple publications. The perioperative mortality earlier on was 23%, so for many years these procedures were, were not in favor. But with improvements in surgery, surgery and post-surgical uh, management, the mortality rates have been quite low. And if you combine the more recent series of 77%, but there is a perioperative mortality that patients need to know, which is real. There are complications. 60% of patients will experience complications. These are very extensive surgeries, as you all know. And then about 15 16%, these, many of these patients need a second surgery to correct the complication. However, because the perioperative mortality was, uh, was here, with the five-year survival being very low, um, this was not in favor for many years. But as things have improved surgically, now the perioperative mortality has gone significantly down with the survival being reported in some series of over 50%. This is potentially curable option in many women nowadays. Now, extended resection is what we call out-of-the-box surgery. This is where the tumor extends laterally, your non-classical exenerative cases. These are very difficult surgeries. They often involve the vasculature of the pelvic sidewall. Sometimes the, the external iliac and internal and common iliacs might be involved. The obturator muscles and or bone, pelvic bones are involved. And we have attempted the very extended resections in these cases and with some uh, favorable outcomes and offer some long-term control in some of these cases with five-year survival, uh, disease-free survival, and overall survivals of about 40%. This is as compared to 0% of five-year survival for these patients if treated with chemotherapy. Now, the most important thing is a negative margin resection with a five-year survival of about 50%, which is uh, respectable. But if you have a positive margin, there is no five-year survival. So really, the goal of these surgeries is for a, positive, a negative margin resection, which can lead to many complications, especially if nerve and bone are resected, which we do consider. Now, just one other thing about exonerations nowadays. We, I think we are going back to the wet colostomy. This was Dr. Brunswick's wet colostomy, where the ureters were inserted pro, proximal to the stoma. Now, by doing a double barrel colostomy, as, as reported by, by Uro, urologic group in 1989, you perform a loop colostomy and insert the ureters in the distal limb of the, of the double barrel colostomy. Therefore, there are actually two exit points without mixing of the fecal and urinary stream. In publications, this is from our colleagues in Ohio State, show that the double barrel wet colostomy actually is quicker to perform as compared to an ileal conduit even. The length of stay is less. Comp bowel anastomoses are none because you already resected the colon. You don't have to resect a small bowel additionally. And at the, at the complication rates are much less. This is the same as compared to a, a continent urinary diversion. So this is very promising. We have now started routinely considering this for our public exam, total public exonerations in which both the urinary and fecal streams need to be diverted, where we've been now considering routinely. And there's just one bag to manage. Recurrent cervical cancer, if not surgical candidates, chemotherapy is considered. Uh, here are some of the agents with some activity. As you can see, the response rates are ex ex exceedingly low. Platinum-based therapy is still the standard uh, first line for recurrence. And 
uh, of most of note, most recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, of which we were authors on. Uh, this was a randomized trial assessing the role of bevacizumab, but it was also assessing the role of non-platinum-based therapy. What you can see here is that cis-platinum-based therapy versus topo with, with taxol, this is cis-platinum and tacotaxol versus topo and taxol, the cis-platinum-based regimen had an improvement and still in median progression-free survival. The overall survival was not statistically different, but this again shows that cis-platinum with taxol is still considered the, the primary first option for patients with recurrent cervical cancer. Topotecan with platinum is a consideration uh, in some patients who cannot tolerate cisplatin. What this trial also shows is that bevacizumab had a statistical, statistical improvement in survival, overall survival of about four months here. Um, and so this led to an NC, NCI uh, alert that bevacizumab now uh, is, uh, is to be considered in the treatment of patients with recurrent cervical cancer. Uh, and is now FDA approved for use in this, for this indication. We've also recognized that Bevacizumab or Avastin, the brand name, is not available, easily available worldwide. Uh, and one can argue whether four months median improvement in overall survival is really worth the extra cost of Avastin. That is a debate that is ongoing. But this is now a consideration for patients with recurrence who cannot, uh, are not surgical candidates, to treat them with cisplatin, taxol, and Bevacizumab. So, in conclusion, I think that cervical cancer is a, the treatment of cervical cancer is evolving. There are many exciting new things that are coming about. I think that one of the primary focuses that, that we need to keep uh, in mind is that we need to improve screening programs around the world. Not just around the world, but in many parts of the United States also, screening is still uh, uh, limited. Uh, the role of central lymph node is exciting. We'll have to see what, what emerging data show. Surgical staging remains to be seen as to what that role will be. The role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is also quite interesting, and we need to see what that will what show. Now, there are many investigations looking at uh, the role of immunotherapies, the anti-PD-1 agents, the CTLA agents, and uh, of course, we need to identify better agents for the treatment of these patients with recurrences especially. So I thank you for your time. I hope this was uh, helpful, um, and I think we'll take some questions now, Dave. I only have a few more minutes. Hello, doctor. We do have one question for you. Uh, could you okay. please share your experience on hysterectomy for persistent disease post-radiation? Yeah, that's a very good question, and we always encounter that. I think that um, in some studies that I've, I've looked at chemoradiation, there was an adjuvant hysterectomy performed. That's not for persistence, but um, uh, so the, it's debatable uh, whether to perform any surgery. Our approach has been, uh, and those who receive primary chemoradiation, uh, if there's no visible disease, then we just continue to observe. One also needs to remember that radiation has prolonged effects. And if you take the literature from the rectal uh, cancer uh, experience, where uh, the longer you wait for the rectal recession, the greater likelihood is that they'll have no, no cancer left, meaning that the radiation continues to work over time. So we really need to make sure that there's just true persistence. And honestly, if a, a patient with cervical cancer with persistent disease, the their outcome may not be um, as good as we'd like to. So here, even if that persistent disease, we sometimes continue to just observe to hope to see if the radiation continues to have effect. Uh, and we really reserve ad, uh, additional surgery for those who are starting to have documented progression. It's quite difficult to not want to operate in someone who has persistent disease. However, it would not be unreasonable to consider uh, uh, a resection of those with persistent disease. Unfortunately, many of those resections would involve a more exonerative type approach. So it's a very individualized decision. There's no one standard answer for that. Here we have been favoring uh, really reserving surgery after chemoradiation for, for, for documented progression of the tumor. But it's very difficult to sit tight on these patients. Thank you very oh, much, welcome. Dr. Laito. Uh, uh, despite well, being a urologist, we are neighbors in the pelvis, but uh, um, yes. it, was, it was a wonderful knowing about the new concept. If I could ask a very quick question. Uh, yes. We are also interested thinking of uh, organ preserving surgery for very, very highly selected cases. And uh, so you stressed upon screening of these patients. Uh, is there any development on organ preserving uh, management of early or uh, high grade of dysplasias or pre-malignant conditions of cervix? Yeah, you know, we, uh, yeah, for dysplasias, we actually are very organ preserving. So usually for dysplasias, just an excisional cone biopsy is all that's necessary. Um, 
Okay. It gets a, a little bit challenging uh, for younger women who have persistent high-grade dysplasia. Our low-grade dysplasia we're not too concerned about. We can often just observe with uh, follow-up pap smears. But for the high-grade dysplasias, uh, fortunately, we can often get a negative margin cone biopsy excision, so that preserves the organ entirely. Uh, there are some women where the margins are always positive. Uh, in an older patient, then we would perform a simple hysterectomy in that situation. Who, well, not older, patients completed their childbearing. And women who have to want to preserve fertility, um, it's a very careful discussion if we cannot repeat the cone biopsy in terms of just following them closely, um, hopefully detecting any invasive process earlier on and allowing them to try to get pregnant as soon as possible. Thank you very much. We would let you go and uh, we enjoyed your talk as much. Thank you very much. Oh, you're Over welcome. Thank today. you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Dr. Latea. We really appreciate it. I know you said you needed to leave, you know, 15 minutes yeah. ago, so thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Have a wonderful day, everybody. And we do want to thank Dr. Latea once again for being here this morning, giving us this time on this Saturday morning. And I want to thank everyone around the world who's attended this Vaticuti Scholar webinar. We appreciate your taking time out of your days as well. And I'm going to wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening wherever you are, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time. Thank you again.